I am excited. This is one of my, if not my most favorite week of the year. I love Holy Week. It's like Christmas for me. It's what Christmas should be, really. Holy Week is incredible. I'm so excited I let my wife pluck my eyebrows last night. That's how <laughs> pumped I am about Holy Week. I don't know how you get ready for Easter, but that's a tradition now in my family. Everybody's plucking eyebrows. I'm super pumped. Now, it hasn't always been this way. I haven't always loved Holy Week, mostly because I grew up in a tradition, and maybe some of you did as well, where you kind of went Palm Sunday to Easter, and you didn't do really any of the stuff in between because other denominations did that stuff. So when I moved out to Dallas from Atlanta, uh, I didn't move out here with any family. I had a, a friend in Atlanta that moved with me. We became roommates, We're still good friends, best friends to this day. And, and while we were here, we attended a local church, and I wasn't very plugged in. I was really focused in on my studies. That was my fault, not the church's fault. That was my fault for not being more involved. And I remember one Easter Sunday, we went to, uh, to church that Easter Sunday. My roommate and I went to an earlier service. I think maybe went and got like Wendy's or something. That was our Easter lunch. Again, single guys. So, And we came back to the apartment, and I remember thinking to myself, that was it. Like that was, my, that was my Easter. This is supposed to be one of, if not the most significant days of the year in my faith. I'm learning to be a pastor. I'm learning to lead people in my faith. And that's what I did for Holy Week. I went to church and I had Wendy's. Nothing wrong with Wendy's. I got a, mm, nice. But I knew at that point it had to be something more. And so I kind of began to look for and explore the, the actual calendar of the church, the church calendar, and what significance there was behind Holy Week. And it's come alive for me. I love Holy Week. So I don't know where you are. I don't know how you're planning on looking at the week ahead. I don't know if you're just here at church on Sunday and you're like, Palm Sunday, why is everybody excited about this? It's not this, not this part, not this palm. It's a branch, just so you know. You know we're going rudimentary here. That was a joke, y'all. I know it. Come on, man. Wow. My wife told me not to say that, and she's right. So it's, it's an exciting time, and I don't know where you are with Holy Week. I don't know if you just kind of are like here for Palm Sunday, and then I'll see you on Easter. And you're not planning on really being in touch or involved. You don't really know what to do with the week. Well, I want us to spend today, and I want us to look at the triumphal entry. Matthew 21, chapter is where we're going to be. And I want us to look at how we can really get ready for Easter, prepare for Holy Week. And so we're going we're gonna to look at how we might prepare for the King. What can we do to make this week more meaningful and actually observe God working in our life? So the first thing we need to do is we need to prepare for the King. Prepare for the King. Look at chapter 21, verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. So Jesus is about to make a grand entrance into Jerusalem. This is very unlike Jesus. Jesus usually kind of slips into the city not unnoticed, he's not secretive about it, but he doesn't really make a big deal of him showing up to places. But this is different. This is entering into his last week of life. He's doing things intentionally. He's put a lot of preparation into this, right? So how's he entering? He's coming from the east, from the Mount of Olives, which means, but he started in the north. So rather than going from the north straight down, he would have cut through Samaria, which most Jews wouldn't have done. But Jesus has proven that he didn't really care about stuff like that. But this time he takes the route from Jericho in the east over the Mount of Olives and into Jerusalem. He's doing this for a specific reason. We'll talk about it. He's got a, a donkey that he wants to get. He wants to ride in, and he's worked out this system. So when I was younger, and pretty much until this week when I started studying it, I thought when Jesus says to his disciples, just go, and if anybody accuses you of stealing livestock... Just tell him the Lord has need of these. And I thought this was a miracle that Jesus was working, like from a distance. Like he was like from half court, like working some things out, right? No, that's not actually, I think, what's happening. I don't want to diminish the miracles of Jesus. But I think Jesus has actually planned ahead here. Mar Mary and Martha live in Bethany, which is really nearby. And I'm wondering if, if some people think, some scholars think, that he's actually just coordinated ahead of time and been like, hey, I need to secure some, some animals to ride on. 
this is, the, this is the password that says these are my guys coming to get them. He's going to borrow, and it's been pr- prepared in advance. So why is Jesus going to all of this trouble to prepare for this? Matthew tells us in verse 4, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Jesus is doing this to fulfill a prophecy, to fulfill a prophecy. If you actually read the entire uh, section, that uh, this is from Zechariah 9.9. If you read Zechariah 9.9 and Zechariah 9.10, Uh, It's really cool what Jesus does uh, here as he's quoting it. He says in verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Jesus is coming as a king that you wouldn't expect. He's not coming as a conquering king. He's coming as a humble king, a king mounted on a donkey. He's not coming with instruments of war. In fact, the passage says that he disbands, he dismantles the instruments of war. There's no need for warfare anymore. He speaks peace to the nations. He's a diplomat. He has a soft and gentle tone. He's not a conquering king marching up to the city with an army. In fact, the picture is just the opposite. He, he, he rides up to the city and Jerusalem flings open its doors and says, no, come in. We want you to rule over us. That's the image that's being presented. And all of this is to show not just that Jesus is a king. There's a lots of ways, lots of ways that Jesus could have shown he was a king. He could have gotten a big war horse, a stallion, and just ridden up to the gates with this kind of, he's got a mass of pilgrims from Galilee coming with him as well. They're the ones singing in a minute. He could have done that. We know that Jesus has power. He's calmed the waves. He's calmed the storm. He could have shouted at the walls of Jerusalem, fall down, and they would have just fallen down, and he could have walked right in and been like, I'm here. I'm in charge now. Or he could have maybe set up like a satellite kingdom up in Galilee and made Rome come to him and fought a guerrilla kind of warfare if he wanted to go that way. There's a lot of things he could have done to have been a king. But Jesus isn't interested in proclaiming just that he's a king. He's interested in proclaiming what kind of king he's going to be. What kind of king? Humble, gentle, compassionate, peaceful, loving, sacrificial. This is incredible because he he rides up to the gates and he he wants to win the city and win your hearts and my hearts without battle or without bloodshed. The only blood he sheds is his own. What a strange king. And this can help guide our preparation for Holy Week. As we look forward to starting Holy Week, this is the first day of the week, so you still got time, we can actually look at how this might construct how we do it. We need to think about what we might do and what we might not do to celebrate the resurrection of our King and Him living inside of us. Just like Jesus made decisions about what kind of king he was presented, the things we do this week should illustrate what kind of king we serve. I think when I hear this, I think to myself, like, wow, that's a lot of preparation, right? Like, God, Travis, you don't understand how busy I am. That's a lot of work going into my week. And I think that's one of the reasons why I didn't really do anything for Easter when I was in seminary. I was busy. I had a lot of stuff going on. I didn't have time to come up with my own traditions. And again, like I said, I came from a background, from a tradition, which is a Baptist tradition, that didn't really do Holy Week. We saw you on Palm Sunday, and we'll see you next week for the celebration of Easter. And so this is one of the things that I love about what we're doing here at Park Cities this week. I think you look at the calendar maybe this week, and you think, wow, there's a lot of stuff to do. I feel like they're just trying to keep us busy. That's not the purpose. That's not the goal. We don't have things here this week because we just want our church filled all the time. That's not the purpose. The purpose, and I really love this, we have so many things for you to be involved in this week because we're giving you tools to walk through Holy Week to the cross, to Easter with Jesus and help make this week meaningful for you. So what am I talking about? We got the journey starting. It starts tomorrow. It's this opportunity for you to take yourself, your family, your friends, and kind of go through a living sort of Easter experience, a Holy Week experience. 
something 3D experiential. I'm planning on going, I think, Tuesday or Wednesday with my family. You should plan on schedule a time to go. It's open pretty much, I think, from like 10 to 7. I think it's open later on uh, Wednesdays. So schedule some time to go with your family and walk through this and talk about what it is. That's something you don't have to plan. You just have to put it on your schedule. Another thing we're doing, Good Friday here. Good Friday at Park Cities is the best. Now, I did kind of tip my hand there and say that I didn't do a lot for Good Friday growing up, so maybe I don't know if there's other things. But I really think what we do here is incredible. It's called a Silent Lord's Supper. It's from 4 to 8. It's not a four-hour service. Hold your breath. It's from 4 to 8, and it's come and go. You come in, you enter in silence, you reflect, you meditate on what God is speaking through His Word, and then you come up to the front, you are given the Lord's Supper from a minister or a deacon, and they offer to pray with you. And I tell you, I can't describe the number of times I've had heartfelt, spirit-oriented and spirit enlivened conversations with people at that place. It is the best thing. And I loved it before I was a pastor here, and I love it even more after. Good Friday is a can't miss at Park Cities. And then there's Easter Sunday. And you see all the time, you see all the opportunities to worship with us on Sunday. Don't forget to fill out your RSVP, RSVP card. That helps us. But plan on being here on Easter. And then Easter's also about, Holy Week's about other people, Right? Because Jesus is about other people. So we're talking about what kind of king he is. We need to be others-oriented just like Jesus is. So we have this who's your one initiative. Who are you praying for? The guy I've been praying for is a guy that I see on Chick-fil-A, uh, Chick-fil-A on Wednesday mornings when I take my daughter to school. And pretty much, this is, this is terrible, I guess, but I'm, I'm discouraged by this, actually. He hasn't been there since I've started praying. I haven't seen him. And so this Wednesday, I'm really praying that he'll be there. So pray with me. I want to invite him. I want him to come. We've also got the, the give up to give. We we're real close on our goal. TJ's actually going to share with you at the end of our service about how close we are, but we still need more. It's an opportunity to bring the story of our king, this gentle, kind, compassionate king, this story to people that don't have it in their own language. And all it costs is a little bit of money, which in the grand scheme of things is not that significant. Well, there are things that we can do to prepare our hearts, prepare our families, prepare our households, for Holy Week and for Easter and the celebration that Easter is. And so if there are things that we can do to get ready, there are also things that we shouldn't do. There are things that we should abstain from this week, <laughs> laying aside those things which aren't helpful. Jesus does this, right? So every time you make a decision to do something, you make intentional decisions not to do something. Jesus chooses to ride on a donkey, which means he's not riding on a camel or a horse or an elephant or an eagle. Okay, I don't know if he could, but he's Jesus. He could, I guess. He's not riding on anything. He's riding on a donkey. And not just a donkey, but a donkey's colt. Again, very specific. And a donkey's colt that's never been ridden before. Very specific. There are specific things that we should choose to do, and because we're choosing to do it, we abstain from other things during this week. So what am I talking about? Well, many of you are excited about a TV show that's coming on tonight. Last season, first episode, Game of Thrones. I'm not going to tell you all the reasons why a follower of Jesus has zero business watching that show. What I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to talk to you about the sex and the violence and all that stuff. I'm going to ask you this, because we're celebrating our king this week. And remember what kind of king he is. And compare the image of the king you have right here in Scripture to the image of kingship that's presented in that show. And you ask me whether or not you should watch that show. You can watch it whatever. I don't, I don't care about later. I do. But, but tonight on Palm Sunday of all nights to watch that depiction of a king the same day we celebrate a king who is humble and gentle. Those don't line up. And think about this. You walk into work on Monday morning and people ask you, hey, did you catch the Game of Thrones last night? No, nah, I didn't. Dude, you lo- what? You love that? Why not? It's Holy Week for me. And I take my faith very seriously. And I don't believe it treats the image of kingship, my king, well. And so I'm skipping this week. And I'm skipping Easter. Because I want to worship well this week. I'm abstaining from this. There are other things you can do as well on top of this. If you don't watch Game of Thrones, then we need some other options as well. 
Maybe take a day off from work. Now, I know some of you need some planning in advance, so Easter next year is April 12th, so you can go ahead and book a day the week before. Some of you have very gracious work establishments, and they give you Good Friday off. That's awesome. If you don't get Good Friday off, if you can, take it off. If you can't, take another day this week. Take a half a day. Reflect, relax. I'm taking time this week. I'm taking days off this week to remember, to reflect, to recharge, and to worship. Also to relax and enjoy and celebrate the freedom that I have in Christ. Something else you can do is maybe skip lunch this week. Maybe one day, a couple days a week. You won't starve. You'll be fine. And spend time in prayer. Go to a park. Meditate. Read scripture. Follow along. Bible Gateway has some great uh, walking through Holy Week devotionals that you can do. BibleGateway.com. Maybe meet with friends and pray and gather around. Skip the gym. Skip the gym for a week and be like, no, my, my physical health is not as important as this this week. You'll be fine. And look, I just gave you an excuse to skip the gym. <laughs> Who doesn't love that, right? Preparation is important as we move in to Holy Week. But so is our response. Our response is also important. So we need to be able to respond to the king. Look at verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. So the disciples are good disciples, and they go and do exactly what Jesus tells them to do. And Jesus climbs up on this donkey, and this is very rare because it, for Passover, the tradition was you walked to Jerusalem. And when Jesus gets on this donkey, the people lose their minds. Again, he's traveling with Galilean pilgrims, and they go crazy. Look at verse 8. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. These folks from Galilee love Jesus. Do you know why? He's their guy. He's their guy. He grew up around them. He's from their, their area. He's from their part of the world. And they don't understand really what kind of Messiah he's going to be. And there's been some frustration because every time they're like, woo, son of David, like this is the Messiah. He's like, no, 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 don't tell anybody. Keep that quiet. And this is the first time that Jesus is like, yep, this is who I am. It's almost like when a, when a candidate for president actually reveals they're going to be pres president and their followers are like, oh, we knew it all along and they're so excited. Like, this is what's going on. It's like, oh, he's, he's going to do it. Like, like, this is it. They're so excited that they start taking off clothing, which is weird. And they start throwing it down on the ground and cutting branches. I've never been so excited that I took off my jacket and threw it on the ground, I guess. But, and then they start singing. They start singing what's called the Hallel, the back end of the Hallel. It's Psalm 118, which we've talked about before. And it's Hosanna. That word Hosanna means God save us, God save us, God save us. So when we were just singing Hosanna, you were singing, didn't realize it, maybe, God save us, God save us, God save us. Now, by the time we get to Jesus' day, Hosanna is kind of like the way we say hallelujah. We've forgotten what it means, and so we just kind of say it as, a, as an offer of praise to the Lord. And so they're singing this, this song, and while they're singing, this crowd is massive. Okay, so there's a Greek word for massive or for, for large that's mega, right? It's where we get mega from. They don't use this word here. They use another word that's used much less that means gigantic, massive. I think my, my Greek dictionary said bigger than Godzilla is the way that it's, it doesn't really say that. But anytime you get a group of people that's really large together and they start singing and there's no direction, it can sound like people singing or it can sound like a massive sort of upheaval, like a riot. And that's what Jerusalem thinks is happening. Look at verse 10. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. That word stirred up means uh, sometimes used to describe an earthquake. Other times it's used to talk about uh, like a mental anguish or, or emotional anxiety going on. So they're freaking out in Jerusalem. They're stirred up saying, who is this? Who's causing this problem? And the crowd said, this is the prophet. This is the prophet. Meaning this is the one who Moses promised would come that would be greater than us. This is the prophet. Oh, and guess where he comes from? He's from Galilee. He's from our town. He's from our place. They're kind of bragging about it. The Galileans respond. They're really, really excited. Now, we don't know how the Jerusalem Jews took this, but here's what I do know. By the end of the week, the Jerusalem Jews are chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. 
So you've probably heard people say before, and maybe this is possible, that the people that were shouting Hosanna in the highest were the same ones that were shouting crucify him at the end of the week. Probably not. Probably two totally different groups of people. You've got the people from Galilee who were excited and calling him the son of David and, and Messiah. And you've got the Jerusalem Jews who are like, you know what, we really like our comfort. We really like our security. We don't want Rome to like come in here and burn the place down. So let's just keep things the way that they are. And they're the ones shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And the difference between these two groups and the way they respond to Jesus is simply time. The Galileans have seen Jesus work for three plus years, doing ministry in their hometown. And, and the Jerusalem folks have seen it as well, but more in like episodes. They see one or two things, they've heard of him, they know him. But for Nazareth, for Galilee, they've seen it often and regularly. They see it all the time. And they're like, they, they believe, they buy into to Jesus as some kind of a Messiah. Maybe not as they expect. They kind of want him to be a political one. But it's the amount of time spent that dictates how they respond to Jesus on a donkey. And that's pretty telling for us as well. You probably see where this is going. Part of getting ready for Holy Week is anticipating God to do something that you'll need to respond to later. One of the mistakes that I made in seminary was thinking that once I was done with Easter service and swallowed down my double stack from Wendy's, like Easter was over. That was the end of it. But Easter requires response. God is doing something. He will do something this week, big or small, and I need to be ready to respond to it. And depending on how I respond to Jesus, it's probably indicative of how much time I've spent with him this week. If I don't spend a lot of time with him this week, if I, if I, if I kind of do Palm Sunday and I kind of just do Easter Sunday, my response is probably not going to be as sensitive. I'm not going to be as aware maybe of what the Holy Spirit is doing. Now, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit can't do something in you. Holy Spirit's not dependent on us for anything. But maybe you won't be as aware. But if you're walking, if you're following with Jesus every day this week, and you're taking intentional steps, you'll have an opportunity to respond. You'll be aware. You'll be sensitive to what the Spirit is doing. But oftentimes we find ourselves responding like those from Jerusalem. You might look at Holy Week and you might hear this you know, sermon that we're talking through right now and you might think, God, Travis, you don't understand. Like, this is a really busy week for me. I don't need any disruptions. I don't need to think about something. I don't need to feel guilty about other things. Like, I, I, I just I, I want to get through this week. I like the routine, or I don't like my routine at all, but I, I can't get off the treadmill. Everything will just fall apart. Or really, I just want security this week. I want my relationships, my career, my family, my friends, my activities to just go really smoothly, and I want to be secure in that and find my identity in that. I don't really want Jesus to come in and kind of mess everything up. Not this week. I'm really looking forward to doing some things this week. Or I feel really comfortable right now. I'm very happy with how things are. I like the rhythm of my life. I like coming to church on Sunday and then maybe going to a Bible study or connect group at some point and then kind of not really worrying about it for the rest of the week. I like this rhythm. Jesus and I have an understanding. You don't, but you think you do. We have this understanding. I want you to think about that and think about the fear and the trepidation because I have this as well. When, I, when I'm thinking about Jesus doing something big and taking that risk of faith and trusting him to do something in my life, one, I get nervous because I'm afraid he won't do it and then I'll feel foolish, and I'll miss out on something. Or I think to myself, man, he's really just going to disrupt everything I'm doing. But again, I've forgotten how Jesus arrives to Jerusalem. How does he arrive? Humble, mounted on a donkey, peaceful, speaking love and grace. Why would I turn that away? Why would I turn that away? He even says in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary or burdened, and I will give you rest. That's the kind of king who's coming who wants to be a part, who wants to rule and reign in your life. He's not some autocrat who's going to make you jump through a bunch of hoops. Now, might he want to shake some things up in your life? Absolutely. Good kings do that. But he also wants to give you grace and peace and life and security and comfort and a rhythm of life that's sustainable and hopeful. So let's respond with the enthusiasm that the Galileans had. Let's respond the way they did, because we know what kind of Messiah Jesus is. We have the opportunity to respond that well. So for those of you, Jesus isn't your king. Guess what? You've got an opportunity today to make Jesus your king. You've got an opportunity today. All you have to do is believe that what he did this week, 
2,000 years ago. His death, his burial, his resurrection, his person, who he was, matters and it counts for you. And so you are separated from God. And rather than being separated from God, the, the only way that you can heal that breach is by trusting in Christ. You can do that. And then for those of us that, that do follow Christ, that have known him, part of sanctification, of growing more into the image of Christ, is working that gospel story into your life in more and more ways, in other places. Start asking yourself this question as you move through Holy Week and even after Easter. What are areas where I'm not dying to myself? I just celebrated a king who I say I follow, who died for me. How am I dying to myself? What struggle with sin do I have that I keep trying to conquer and I've I've just gotten really discouraged lately? How can I re-up in that fight? How can I take steps to make real decisions to fight this? Have I slipped and stumbled in my personal time with the Lord? Maybe you were doing Year of the Bible with us and we hit Leviticus and Numbers and you're like, I'm out, I'm done. I totally get it. I wavered there too. We're in 1 Kings right now. 1 Kings. Hop back in. Jump back in. Show yourself grace and just jump right back in. Don't try and make up the ground. Not this year maybe. And just start reading. Where are you letting your ambition rule and reign in place of Christ? Where are you trying to seize a throne of your own rather than letting Christ rule and reign? How are those around you hearing Christ through you? Easter can kind of be this spiritual new year for us where we recommit to the God that we say we worship and the King who died for us. Easter can be kind of a spiritual time of renewal. And so after we've prepared and after we've responded, we have an opportunity throughout this season to watch the King work. To watch the King work. Look at verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple And drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. So he just goes into the temple, starts chasing out people who are buying and selling and doing money changing. Now, what's Jesus' beef with what's going on? One, it's not with the economic practice, okay? He's cool with what's taking place. He really is. The, the, there was a tax that you had to pay to worship in the temple. And this was something the government had instituted. And so they had developed these money changers because people were coming from all over the Roman Empire and they had local currency. And so you had to pay it in a certain denomination. And so you could go to these guys and they would change it out for you and you could pay the tax so you could worship. That's good. That's helpful. Also, they were selling animals for sacrifice. And you might think, well, shouldn't you be having your own animal? Yeah, that'd be nice in an ideal world, but if I'm traveling from Rome and it's Passover and I've got to bring with me an unblemished lamb, that's a long way. Imagine putting that on a plane, much less like a boat or overland. You're like, hey, I got my, it's my security animal, right? I got my security lamb right here. Like, and then imagine you're traveling overland or you're traveling over, over water and imagine like your lamb trips and like breaks his leg. Well, you have to offer an unblemished sacrifice. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So you've got to have an opportunity maybe to buy something to offer a sacrifice. It's a convenience, and it's, it's useful for helping people worship. So what's Jesus' problem? Location and abuse. He's mad at the abuse of it. There's a huge markup, right? You ever been to a stadium and bought like a hot dog that you know is an Oscar Mayer wiener, but it's $12? <laughs> I love ballpark food, but yeah, I'm like, okay. That's what they're doing here. That lamb costs way more than a lamb should because it's in the temple, and it's convenient, right? And they know you can't leave until you make your sacrifice. And they're abusing this. There's huge markup. Even on the money changing, there's markup. And then you have a problem with the location. Have you ever been to an open-air market with animals in it? It's loud. It's noisy. Worship should be something that can be reflective and quiet. You shouldn't be distracted by animal noises, at least. And Jesus is like, this shouldn't be here. This used to be on the Mount of Olives, way back out of town. It's now here, smack dab in the middle of worship. So that's Jesus' issue with what's taking place. So he goes through and he upends tables. He upends tables, he throws people out, and he's not really getting rid of everybody. That's the image that we have. He's just going through. The temple courtyard where he's doing this is 33 acres. Now, Jesus is God, so he can do whatever he wants, but Jesus is also a man. He's going through and he's clearing out a section. If he cleared out all of the people buying and selling, there's a Roman garrison attached to the temple. They would have come down and put down the riot that Jesus had started. He's probably just clearing out a small area where he can teach and do healings, which is what he does next. And he does this alone. He does it alone. In Matthew's gospel, there's actually a a, a different presentation. So Matthew's gospel has the triumphal entry take place. 
Jesus gets off the donkey, walks up to the steps, and clears out the temple. In Mark's gospel, which is actually probably more his time-wise, chronologically more accurate, Mark says that Jesus comes into the temple after the triumphal entry, looks around, leaves, then comes back on Monday and clears it out. So why is Matthew kind of conflating events like this? Why is he putting them together? He's not trying to hide anything. He's not trying to mislead you. He's trying to emphasize something. He's emphasizing that Jesus does this alone. He just marched into town with this massive army of pilgrims who are very happy to do whatever he wants. They are pumped. And so he could have said, hey guys, we're going to go rip down the, the, the buyers and sellers in the temple. And they'd have been like, cool, let's do it. We'll sing a song while we do it. Like the seven dwarves, it'll be great. But Jesus goes in there alone. Why does he go in there alone? I think this foreshadows not only the kind of death that Jesus would have, which was by himself, but the fact that he had to do it by himself. He had to face a broken religious establishment on his own. He had to face our sin, our death, our evil that sent him to the cross. He had to do that alone. And as the band is coming up on stage, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about how this foreshadows the kind of death that Jesus will die because there's this breakdown between us and God. There's a breakdown in this relationship. And the scripture teaches us that he's the only one that can heal that breach. And he's the only one that can give us the faith we need to believe that he can heal that breach, that he's capable of doing that, that his death, his burial and resurrection matters on a cosmic, eternal level that it still resonates 2,000 years later. And not just to give us something fun to do on a Sunday, but that it might rescue and redeem us and restore purpose in our lives, not just for one week, but for 52 of every year that we walk this earth and beyond. So many of us think that once we come into a relationship with Christ, he's beaten sin, death, and evil enough to where he like tags us in like we're tag team partners, and then we have to fight the rest on our own. He's weakened them, but it, we can't, and that's not how it works. Jesus does it all, and he does it alone. This doesn't mean you don't cooperate with Jesus. You don't, you know, obviously, you do that. But if we're going to have victory over the things in our lives that trip us up, that hem us in, that discourage us, that break our hearts, it has to be through the power of Christ or it's not going to happen at all. And this means we have to trust Jesus with whatever it is that we're facing. Whatever you're dealing with, it is him alone who can rescue you, who can rescue us. We need to trust that he can do it. So that broken relationship that you have, that broken friendship maybe, that broken self-perception that you have. Jesus reminds us, he's our humble king, right? He extends us grace even though we broke that relationship with him. So he gives us grace and he restores us to our relationship with the Father. And then we can go out and restore those relationships with other people. We can offer others grace as well. Maybe you need to offer yourself grace as well. There's a great song by Andrew Peterson. It's about loving your enemies with one of your chief enemies being yourself. That struggle with sin you have or loneliness or heartbreak. Guess what? He gives us community. People to come around us and celebrate and worship with us. To walk through life with you. The closest people in your life shouldn't be people you're related to by your own blood. The closest relationships you should have in life are people you're related to by Christ's blood. We are a family, a community of faith, tied together in the unity of spirit, of the spirit, and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That endless struggle you have with failure, with routine, with the pressure to be the best, he gives us hope. Not hope that we'll get everything we ever wanted but hope that in the grand scheme of things, when Christ returns, those things won't matter as much and that they'll be redeemed and rescued in the light of Christ. Look, if we're ever going to get in the habit of slowing down, of getting off the treadmill, of trusting Jesus and being dependent upon him for everything that we need, Holy Week's the best time to do it. I've done my best to present that argument to you that this week is significant and it's an opportunity for you to take your relationship with Christ, to let him take your relationship deeper and stronger than it's ever been. So whatever challenges, whatever frustrations you have this week that are going to try and disrupt you. I've already had one this morning. I was super pumped coming in for Holy Week. I was pumped about today because it's the first week of Holy Week, first day of Holy Week. I had something happen this morning that really frustrated me, got me angry actually. And I've been praying this morning, Lord, help me focus. Like, Don't let this knock me off the... Off the path that you want me on, Lord. There's going to be things that happen 
that frustrate you. Don't let it. There's going to be things, hopelessness or loneliness that tries to creep in this week because maybe you are separated from family. You're not going to be with them this week. It's things that pull you away. Don't listen to those things that make you want to give over into despair. Pope John Paul says this. I, I love this quote. Do not abandon yourselves to despair. We are the Easter people and hallelujah is our song. We are the Easter people. I almost like that title better than Christians. We are Easter people. We are the people who believe beyond a shadow of a doubt with, with, with great hope and expectation that our King who died is alive again and so we live accordingly. Walk this week in preparation. And one of the ways that we're going to prepare, one of the ways that we're going to get our hearts ready for this week is that we're going to re-enter into a time of worship. We've moved the sermon up in the service so that we're going to have time to respond in worship. And I know that sometimes once the sermon is done, people get up and they kind of go and they get their kids and you kind of try and beat the rush. Don't do that this week. It's Palm Sunday. Slow down. Your kids are fine. That lunch date you got, it's going to be there when you, when you get done. Rest, relax, and worship this humble and gentle king who paid everything so that you might spend, be able to spend eternity with him. So I'm going to pray. We're going to worship. We're going to prepare we're going to respond, and we're going to watch our King do great, great things this week, next week, and all year long. Let's pray. Gracious God, you have sent your Son to us as an offering, a sacrifice to restore us to you. And so God, without flowery words without spending a lot of time talking about it, Lord. We want to do it. We want to worship. And so, God, I pray that you would focus us through your Spirit, keep our eyes upon you, and may we worship our King whom we adore. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.